What we have to understand about pornography is that it literally rewires the brain. Their prefrontal cortex, which is that part of our brain responsible for our self-control, our impulse control, emotional regulation, isn't fully developed till the age of 25. One of the last things that Thomas Crooks reportedly searched for on the internet before he tried to assassinate former President Donald Trump was pornography. It's brought the taboo issue of pornographic addiction back into the limelight. Average age of porn exposure being 12, I think is only going to decline further. Claire Morell is an advocate for child protection and a leading voice in the conversation about digital safety. She's a senior policy analyst at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Kids don't even need to go looking for it anymore. It finds them on social media. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellick. Claire Morell, such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. Thank you so much for having me on. Claire, the Daily Beast reported something very odd, at least to me, um, as they were uh, looking at some information they got from a FBI source about things they discovered on Thomas Crooks, the would-be Trump assassin's phone. And that was that the last internet search, apart from a few things that he had done on the phone, like communicating with his parents, he actually did an internet search for pornography. And, you know, we've been wanting to have this conversation for a while, so I figure this is a great place to start. Um, what's happening here? I mean, that's, I mean, it's shocking. Why in the world would he search for pornography right before he tries to assassinate Donald Trump? But I think what it speaks to is how addictive internet pornography is for this generation because of how common it is and easy to access. So... Kids don't even need to go looking for it anymore. It finds them on social media. And the nature of pornography is to addict its user. If it becomes so addictive, then it's not surprising when someone would be searching, turning to their phone to search for it to get that next dopamine hit. And so I think what mm. we have to understand about pornography is that it literally rewires the brain. And it rewires the brain in, in several different ways. The first is that it creates neural pathways um, that habituate the person to have to continue to access pornography because of such a high level of dopamine is released in the brain when they view this type of content, um, that it actually rewires the brain to need that level of dopamine and to actually crave it. So this neurotransmitter that's involved in really all sorts of addictive substances, um, it's released in the brain um, as a pleasure hormone, but it actually creates craving so that your brain will repeat that activity and do it again. And so I think what we have to understand is that this is not just, oh, kids stumbling across, you know, their uncle's Playboy, but the, the online interactive sexual experiences that children are being exposed to, which are extremely violent, um, are eliciting this dopamine response that is highly addictive that rewires their brain to constantly crave and want more. And it also desensitizes the brain to the pleasures of the natural world um, because of the level of stimulation provided by the online pornography. They constantly crave it. They need more. And so then the normal everyday daily things around them don't elicit that response. And so they actually become desensitized to things in the real world. And so it's a really alarming problem that I don't actually think many people are paying attention to. I would call it the kind of stealth public health crisis of today in the sense that it is having these mental and physical effects on children, especially at a stage when their brains are still developing. And so it's forming these people, habituating children into becoming addicts um, to something that is inherently harmful to them, to their bodies, to their brain. And I hope we can talk about too, the social impact that this is having on children's relationships, formations, and just the, the societal level impacts we're seeing from kids accessing this types of content. What you're describing, right, to me that, has an effect not just on children, mm -hmm. but on adults. That same phenomenon happens. It's just that children's brains are a lot more plastic. That's right. Well, what? give me a sense of the scale of this. And, le and of course, we're going to talk about kids today, but I, I, I do think a lot of what we're going to talk about with kids actually applies to adults as well. Mm -hmm. Just like the, the maybe the legal dimensions are a bit different, right? Yes. But, 
Yeah. Um, no, it's a great question. To your point about the plasticity of children's brains, that is, I think, why we're particularly focusing on kids because their brains are still developing and those neuron pathways are being formed. And if they're formed towards pornography, it's going to be very dangerous and hard for them to overcome. And so on the prevalence scale, um, it's very hard to measure these things. A lot of the surveys that have been done are self-reported. They try to interview teenagers and try to understand you know, how many have access to pornography, how often they're accessing it? Did they come across it, across it accidentally? Um, and so, you know, a recent survey from 2022 by Common Sense Media found that um, over three quarters of teens have accessed pornography. The study was done on 13 to 17 year olds. They found the average age of first exposure is 12. Um, and more, uh, the majority of these children are encountering it for the first time accidentally, um, mainly through an online means, clicking a link that they didn't understand was going to send them to a pornographic website. Um, so it's extremely prevalent. And part of this is, as I just mentioned, the kind of online means, children today are carrying smartphones around in their pockets. They have 24 seven access to this type of content and we've never had this before in history. It used to historically, if children were to come across this, it'd actually be very difficult. They'd have to intentionally seek it out. But now with social media, Children don't need to go looking for pornography. It finds them and it can quickly, a curious child just lingering over a post on social media can get quickly sucked down a dangerous rabbit hole of very inappropriate sexual content um, because the app's algorithms go to work and just continue to put more and more of that type of content into children's feeds. And we've seen that average age of first smartphone decrease over the years, where now I believe it's 10 years old. And so that average age of porn exposure being 12, I think is only going to decline further that um, in the reality that we have given children literally mini computers in their pockets tethered to them constantly um, with access to all sorts of apps and the internet where they're just stumbling across this horrific content. And all sorts of things that will be very enticing potentially, but they don't, don't can't remotely understand the consequences of, uh, you know, oh. basically and going down these rabbit holes. It's, it's, I mean, it's oh, yes. very disturbing to me. I'll, I'll, I'll share an anecdote. Um, I was um, at a meeting where Basically, there was someone giving a presentation about, you know, some work they were going to do. They provided a website that you could check out and, you know, see what they were doing. Nothing to do with pornography. However, I must have entered something wrong on the website. <laughs> oh, and goodness. I'm sitting there with my iPad, right? And all of a sudden, there's some very not safe for work things happening on my iPad. I'm scrambling to hide it, right, sort of thing. And But it just really highlighted, like, it really made me think a lot, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was very unintentional, mm -hmm. right? On Twitter, for example, I had to put my safety, uh, uh, I guess, setting on because yeah. I just didn't, you know, every once in a while you get this thing that you really don't want to be seeing at all, like remotely, right? So anyway, um, <laughs> it, it must be incredibly easy for children and they don't, they will not have that. I mean, I'm just remembering myself as a kid. Like yeah. you, you would see this, you'd be like, oh, well, what is this? Let's check this out. You wouldn't have that. Oh yeah. In many cases that, barrier, right? Mm -hmm. Well, kids are very naturally impulsive. Like they're not thinking through the long-term consequences and they're naturally curious. And so I, Big porn to me is preying on kids' natural curiosity. They are putting this content out all of their social media. Um, there's a symbiosis between pornography sites and adult apps like OnlyFans and social media. These uh, porn performers and porn websites are actually going to social media to recruit new users. And so it's very easy for a kid to stumble across it and to think, oh, what is that? And just click on a link without even thinking further. Because as I mentioned, their prefrontal cortex, which is that part of our brain responsible for our self-control, our impulse control, emotional regulation isn't fully developed till the age of 25. To me, it's tragic that these children whose brains are not fully developed are being thrust into a very adult online world without the ability to handle it. And I've summarized this as saying the great digital paradox is that kids have access to adult content more than ever before in human history, the kind of world that they're thrust into well, they, online. If I may, if yeah. I may they have 
access to all sorts of adult content that adults haven't had access to oh, throughout absolutely. history. No, no, no. It, we, right? this is unprecedented levels, um, never before seen in history because of the technology. And at the same time, children have never been less prepared to handle it because their brains are not fully developed and actually accessing the kind of social media technology, the constant dopamine hits that they're getting is stunting the brain's ability to develop that prefrontal cortex. It is the reward circuitry of the brain is really overtaking um, the prefrontal cortex, that emotional and um, self-control aspects. The technologies have been designed to hijack our brain's natural vulnerabilities, and so it's being wired uh, a certain way that is detrimental to their well-being and to their long-term success in life. Um, well, and they're also getting, if I'm you know, I'm mixed messages in many cases about how to deal with such things. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I'm just saying, like, there's this sort of snowball effect of multiple factors that yes. might get someone in through that door and start getting hooked. Yeah. Right? Yes. Let me give you a few examples because I think it's, it's helpful to try to understand, like, what exactly are we talking about? Um, the online world today, like, not even the most extreme, you know, pornographic websites, but just taking social media like Snapchat or TikTok is full of this type of sexualized content. And it's sending a message. Like to me, we have to understand that the medium is the message and the message that this medium of social media, the way it's designed for likes and followers is sexualized and is trying to send the message that sex is normal, including for children, including violent, aggressive sex. And so what's happening is children are on social media, they want likes, they want followers, and they're incentivized to post very sexualized photos of themselves. And they think it's normal because the content that they're taking in is very sexualized. And um, the porn companies and the big tech companies are really hijacking children's vulnerabilities. Um, and it's happening on apps that I don't think parents are fully aware of, you know, the harm that's on there. Like in Snapchat, which is, you know, very common popular app for young kids, within four clicks, a child can get to Pornhub, the kind of For You Feeds page often advertise these types of content. And the parental controls don't work inside of the apps. If you've installed a filter on the phone, you've activated the setting that says, I don't want them to be able to access adult websites. What parents don't realize is there are browsers within the social media apps. And if a child clicks on a Pornhub link inside of Snapchat, they'll be brought to Pornhub's page all within the app. And that's something that the parent can't see into and the filter is not given access to work inside of the app. And so with a smartphone and just hundreds of apps, there are just uh, thousands of portals to this type of content that are incredibly difficult for parents to oversee effectively. Um, and so it really is a dire situation. Um, and and so that's why a lot of my work focuses also on, on trying to help pass better laws to back parents up and to protect our kids. Claire, we're going to take a quick break right now, and we'll be right back. And we're back with Claire Morell, Director of the Technology and Human Flourishing Project at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. My sense is that this is a really big issue, but it just you just never really see it on the surface. Like you come across that's it right. randomly, but it's not something that's really talked about. And frankly, this Thomas Crook's connection is the first time I've seen it talked about mm. in a while. It just doesn't come up often, yeah. it seems, right? Or am I right? Like, no, okay. I think that, I think part of the, the thing that's difficult about pornography is there's this kind of, you know, stigma to it. And um, I think it's difficult because it is such a sensitive topic to be discussed publicly. But I think if we're going to actually um, protect children and make a difference, we have to be willing to have the hard conversations. Um, and I think because of how ubiquitous it is, often, you know, people feel implicated by it. And I'll just give this statistic to kind of um, help us understand. Uh, an Australian study in 2017 of like 15 to 29 year old men just asked about pornography use and 100% of them had seen or viewed pornography. They could not find a single man in that 15 to 29 year old survey that they did. And I can't remember the exact amount, but it was a large survey that had never, that had not seen or come across this. And so I think to the point about how the smartphone and the internet and social media have changed the nature of this 
like everyone is affected. Everyone has come across this or seen it. And unfortunately, because it is so addictive, it can just very easily hook people and draw them in. And it becomes a really just shameful kind of struggle that people don't even know how to talk about the fact that they feel so drawn and addicted to this. And I think that is kind of the power of it. Um, the really kind of sad power is that when it hooks and addicts people, it makes it very difficult for them to reach out for help or to talk about this publicly. And I think people often feel you know, guilt or shame for their addiction. And I, I really feel for them. And I'm not trying to shame people who are, who have become addicted to pornography, but to try to say it, it's actually like not your fault. It's big porn has designed it this way to prey on our human weaknesses and vulnerabilities. And so we have to be willing to kind of take them on to get to the root of the problem and say like, yes, we want to shut down people's access for kids, you know, try to make it as difficult to access as possible. But we have to really go to the root of the problem, which is addressing the kind of the porn companies and in order to really like help people to become freed from this. Um, because I, yeah, just anecdotally know lots of people People who have struggled um, for years and they're actively trying to fight it and to do so they basically have to lock down all their devices um, just like a drug addict is drawn to it and they can't even you know taste like a, a, a sip of alcohol if they were an alcoholic they, it's a kind of a they must kind of completely shut off access well, but it's and, difficult when it's the internet and have some sort of accountability system yes. like you know the Alcoholics Anonymous or, or some, right. something of that nature. I can yes. imagine, as you're describing this, I'm just sort of imagining like what, what might work for people. Yes. To, to yes, and I think, um, you know, I don't know if I, had, I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, addiction scientists, how they define like what is addictive is by how much dopamine this activity or this substance releases is how addictive it is. Um, so drugs like heroin or cocaine are like highly addictive because it, releases a very high unnatural amount of dopamine and studies have found that pornography online internet kind of interactive pornography has a very similar effect where it releases a very high level unnatural amount of dopamine which means that it's inherently addicting um, because what dopamine does is as I mentioned creates craving and so then as soon as they've seen it they want to they click they want to click to watch more they want the next kind of hit and so I think we do have to really treat this as a very addictive substance and think of about regulating it the same way we have regulated alcohol, tobacco, um, you know, drugs, other addictive things that we know that it's difficult for people to resist, um, but it's harmful to their health, it's harmful to their development, particularly of children. And so we have to think about ways to try to cut off the root of how people are getting access to this. But it's very difficult when it's the internet and it's something that's in our pockets, you know, 24 7. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't, if we're talking about dopamine, I can't help but think of, you know, the, the, the good uh, product, oxytocin, yeah. right? Yeah. When we're talking about this, right, you can't help but think really a lot of this has to do with the, the fact that the device is with you all the time. It makes it harder for you to have those human relationships, which in turn also drives that yeah. cycle. Like you just see people walking around with their phones or you see, you know, I, there's these, you know, photos of, you know, family, everyone sitting there. Everyone sitting, staring the, at sitting, the phone. Sitting, so staring at their phone, yeah. right? Yeah, so um, there's there's a real difference between dopamine and oxytocin, which um, Arthur Brooks has mentioned in his studies. He studies happiness. And so, you know, both of them, uh, both uh, dopamine and oxytocin are, you know, related to pleasure, like pleasure hormones. But dopamine really just creates a craving so that you do that activity again that gave you that experience of pleasure. It actually doesn't create satisfaction in the brain. So it's actually just creating a constant craving for more and more and more. Whereas oxytocin, which we get from real life interactions, um, that hormone is released from eye contact, physical touch. It's actually the hormone that bonds us to other humans. It bonds mothers to their babies. It bonds husband and wife. It bonds friends um, because we're interacting and we're experiencing oxytocin when we're in person together with eye contact and physical physical touch and it helps create bonds of trust and mutual love and responsibility that we really need to survive and thrive as a civilization. 
the online world does not produce oxytocin. It produces these shallow connections, not real relationships, and it's all based around dopamine. And so kids are, you know, every time they get a like on their post or a new follower, they get a little hit of dopamine that draws them back for more. And so I've tried to explain this to parents and policymakers that when you talk about, oh, well, we'll just put screen time limits in place, the screen time limit isn't sufficient in the sense that if, even if they're on for 15 minutes a day, they're going to be constantly craving craving more. And it's actually the online world will dominate their mental space the rest of the day. They're going to be thinking about who else liked my photo or maybe someone else, you know, started following me. I have to go on and check. It's like this constant urge to go on and see and get that next hit of dopamine. And pornography does the same thing. The, you know, the pornography creates this dopamine response. And so you just, you just want to go view more. It's never enough. There's never satisfaction. And so what I am concerned about from a civilizational standpoint, is that we're wiring these kids to become dopamine addicts and dopamine addicted users to social media or to online pornography and they're not able to form relationships in real life. Um, and there's been studies done that show that oxytocin isn't released through the screen. Like even on a Zoom call, you're actually not getting oxytocin, even if you're talking to someone through the screen. It's something that can only happen in the real world. And if we're allowing kids to inhabit the virtual world and that's where they're growing up is completely online, then I worry about what that means for the formation of marriages and families, these building blocks of civilization in the long run, if kids aren't able to learn and develop how to form relationships in the real world um, and relationships that bring really true happiness and satisfaction. Um, I think that is something that um, we're seeing is there's this epidemic rising rates of loneliness, anxiety, and depression, but yet kids are more connected than ever. And it's because the kind of connection is so shallow. It's all based on this dopamine that just creates craving for more that doesn't actually bring satisfaction and happiness. And so thinking about what do we want for our kids? We want their long-term success and happiness. And so we need to focus on helping them inhabit the real world and form real life relationships. Um, and on this is the last point I'll say on this is that long-term like longitudinal studies that have been done of happiness show that the number one predictor of like success as an adult and kind of life satisfaction is actually childhood self-control that amongst all these other factors that people who learned and developed self-control as children the kind of ability for delayed gratification are the happiest adults and social media and online pornography in particular just undermines that ability um, to develop delayed gratification and self-control and so we're really eroding any type of foundation um, that we would want to build for a long-term life of happiness you're basically saying that it's Pornography is just sort of like a, a heightened mm -hmm. version uh, of what these, a lot of the interactions they have online are doing That's anyway, true. like a, just the more, most extreme version. But mm -hmm. this is basically, you know, f foundationally preventing mm -hmm. some, a lot of normal human interaction. And like, yeah. and in the, if that's happening in a early stage of the brain coming together, we don't even have any idea of what the impact will be, but it does create a certain level of isolation. We already know that from what you've told me. Mm -hmm. So this is a, this is a, you know, very troubling, let's say, right? Um, it is. It's very troubling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think kids are inherently habit forming. Like we think about childhood, we're trying to help them develop habits that will make them an independent, successful adult. And allowing them to become habituated towards screens really just caves them in on themselves. It's creating dependency and addiction to these devices or to the kinds of terrible content that they're coming across online. So I think that's something to really pay attention to. Children are being shaped and influenced by something they're always being formed and so what are we allowing them to be formed by well this is something we're definitely going to be covering a lot more on american thought leaders claire morell it's such a pleasure to have had you on thank you so much Jan. thank you all for joining claire morell and me on this episode of american thought leaders i'm your host yanya kellek 